from the book of Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, occasions for stumbling are bound, bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You must forgive. Even if you have really good reasons to be angry, regardless of your prejudices toward the wrongdoer, no matter if we're talking about a repeat offender, you know, the kind of person who will wrong you seven times between your first cup of coffee and your last sip of wine, you must forgive them. Anyone who's ever been wronged or offended or have had their sense of self violated, which I assume pretty much covers all of us to varying degrees, I think we all know that forgiveness isn't easy. Because if we force ourselves to sit with what forgiveness entails, what it requires of us, I think the majority of us would agree that at the end of most days, forgiveness seems near impossible. I think we all find forgiveness as daunting as the disciples did because deep down we sense what they sensed. That offering forgiveness is inextricably tied to matters of the heart, to matters of the soul. That it's not so much a rational transaction or coping mechanism so much as is an expression of our faith. Maybe even the end game of our faith. And if that's the case, it's no wonder Jesus was so interested in forgiveness. Throughout all the Gospels, he goes around traveling the ancient Near East, proclaiming the arrival of God's reign, marked as it is by love and forgiveness, by liberation from the power of sin, and the transformation that this Jubilee-style forgiveness enables. Jesus leverages symbolic numbers like the number seven here, not to limit the forgiveness we have to offer others, but to paint forgiveness as a never-ending, self-perpetuating gift that we've been empowered to give. Those who offer it time and time again are those conditioned to see forgiveness as they do life itself, as a gift born of divine love. But if forgiveness is so central to what it means to follow Jesus, why do we find practicing it so dang hard? Why do we keep trying to will ourselves to forgive those around us only to wind up harboring resentment and bitterness? Why is it that as C.S. Lewis writes, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until he or she has something to forgive? Maybe it's because so much abstract talk about forgiveness on podcasts, in church, even in the realm of politics, maybe that's given us a faulty appreciation of what it actually means to forgive. You know, we misunderstand forgiveness as the natural result 
of our willpower or the natural passage of time. Time heals all wounds, so the saying goes. We take face value readings of scripture or even some good reads.com quotes and mistake the practice of forgiveness as a kind of one and done exchange. We conflate forgiveness with forgetting. We improperly understand it as a sort of forced sweeping under the rug of serious abuses or unhealed wounds. Really, it's no wonder we come to Jesus' charge ready with rebuttals. But forgiveness is much more involved than these kinds of definitions suggest. To forgive is not to self-anesthetize against pain. Ultimately, to forgive is to embrace God's love. For both those who violate us and ourselves. To forgive is to see and know ourselves, our neighbors, even all creation in the same way that our all-loving, all-redeeming God sees and knows us, our neighbors, and even all creation. Or as Miroslav Wolf put it, forgiveness empowers you to recognize the pain you suffered without letting the pain define you, enabling you to heal and move on with your life. To forgive is to condemn the fault but to spare the doer. To condemn the fault, but to spare the doer from being ultimately identified only by his or her offense. So as much as we are tempted to internalize our pain, to define ourselves, our actions and reactions by our wounds and by our unspeakable fear that we might amount to nothing more than our wounds. So too are the individuals and institutions that have cut us deepest. We could also say that to forgive is to recognize the age old truth. Hurt people hurt people. We could go even further and say that to forgive is to recognize that those who continually habitually hurt people know themselves only by the wounds that they themselves have received. I get it. You might be thinking, yeah, that's really easy for you to say behind that protected pulpit. (laughs) This will get you your check, you professional Christian. But you don't know how badly I've been hurt, how irreversibly I've been wronged. And you're right. I'm sure even my closest friends have wounds that I don't know about. Others I could never even pretend to relate to. I could pick any of you here today and quickly realize that I don't know the depths and history of the wrongs committed against you. But if it makes you feel any better, the same goes for me. Sitting down to sense what God had to say to us from this passage Man, I struggled. This is some confronting stuff. Confronting enough that I just ran away from it. I just went to my chair, popped in my AirPods, and hit shuffle. I was hoping for some angry or edgy emotional music, (laughs) you know, to prove that I was right, that this is too hard. But what I got not only helped, but proves how much of a nerd I am. Lay Miz, the soundtrack started playing. (laughs) For those of you who don't know, Lay Miz is a book turned musical that tells the story of a man imprisoned for 19 years just for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his starving nephew. It opens at the end of Jean Valjean's imprisonment with this man first introduced as prisoner 24601 being released on parole. But the parole papers he must always display limits his newfound freedom. 
Though he served his time, Valjean will never be known as anything other than an ex-convict, a man who poses danger to anyone who may cross his path. So likewise, he's shunned by everyone he meets. Employers tell him that there's no work for him. Kids gather to taunt and throw rocks at him. He sleeps outside in a stable, even in the dead of winter. That is, until a bishop finds him and offers him warm food and a bed. A bed, as the bishop sings, that will allow him to rest from pain and rest from wrong. Valjean is stirred by such kindness, but decides it can't be trusted. So that night, when everyone falls asleep, he runs away with all of the bishop's silver. Picked up by a couple constables some miles away, he lies and said that the silver was given to him as a gift. So they bring him back to the bishop just to catch him in his lie. But they're surprised to hear that the bishop is playing along with it. They're even more surprised when the bishop takes out two silver candlesticks and gives them to Valjean. You left the best behind, he sings. After so many years of being known only as a number, Valjean remembers what it's like to be treated as someone worthy of a name. Confronted by the bishop's generous mercy, by his refusal to identify Valjean by his wrongdoings, the man must now face how he himself can only perceive himself as a wrongdoer. Again, I won't sing, but Valjean wonders to himself, this man told me that I have a soul. How does he know? What spirit comes to move my life? Is there another way to go? Remembering how the bishop treats Valjean and how it utterly transforms this bent over man, it opened my eyes to what might be at work in Jesus' charge to forgive. Even more so, it allowed me to see how Jesus' command motivates the disciples' sincere request for increased faith. Because it couldn't have been for his own benefit that the bishop forgave Valjean. For all intents and purposes, it cost the bishop his most valuable possession to open to Valjean the way of forgiveness. But the more I sat with today's passage in one hand and the soundtrack of Les Mis in the other, I realized the bishop didn't forgive Valjean for stealing what had to have been his most valuable possession. No, really, the bishop leveraged his most valuable possession to free Valjean to release him from society's characterization as a criminal offender beyond hope for wholeness. To do this, the bishop relied on his faith. And though I'm sure the bishop studied doctrine and affirmed theological tenets, that's not really what I'm talking about when I point out his faith. And I'm not so sure that's what Jesus means by faith either. Because truly, the faith of Jesus could be summarized simply as a foundational confidence or trust that God is good, that God is present and active in our lives, and that God loves us more than we could ever comprehend. The faith of Jesus is faith that on top of all of this, God is on our side. Jesus trusted all this about God despite the pain he faced, despite how society fought to define him or how his community maligned him, despite even how his closest friends betrayed him. But there's more. Ultimately, the faith of Jesus affirms all this good stuff, not only for Jesus, the Christ, 
but also for the little ones the disciples were charged with protecting. The poor, the disabled, the sick, and those without societal standing or status. The faith of Jesus is what motivates Jesus to later beseech God to forgive even those who see to his execution. The wealthy, the powerful, the high-status religious leaders. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, he cries out from the cross. It's this kind of faith, the faith of Jesus, that allows and expects us to start the impossible work of forgiveness, of freeing ourselves from the wounds we inevitably receive and freeing those who wound us from self-understandings that paint them as anything or anyone other than beloved children of God. I think I'm starting to understand Jesus' point here, that seeds of faith, when nurtured in a community that tries its best not to trample them, that those can eventually blossom into orchards of forgiveness. The kind of forgiveness that allows even our worst offenders to understand themselves as God understands them. Beloved, I'm starting to understand that if forgiveness is the end goal of our faith, maybe a fresh appreciation of faith is a good first step to take. Even if all we have is seed-sized faith, even if all we can muster today is the belief that God exists, maybe that's enough to do the impossible for now. If, like Jesus said, this seed-sized faith is enough to cast a tree into the ocean, maybe it's enough to help us forgive those who demean and demoralize us too. And maybe, just maybe, as we take the first step of forgiveness, we'll recognize our faith grow. We'll find peace, divine power, transcendent security in who and how we've been created to be. Remembering what it means to have the faith of Christ will motivate us not to ignore the pain of our wounds, nor to accept the habitual abuse from those who are supposed to love us well. But tending to this seed form faith will somehow enable us to see ourselves and those who harm us, ultimately and most importantly, as those whom God also loves, as those in whom God's goodness is blossoming even if there are some weeds still left in competition. All in all, restoring the meaning and purpose of our faith is the first step to forgiveness. Committing ourselves to being a community shaped not only by the Spirit of Christ, but by the faith of Christ as well. And that's how one day we might be able to cry out to God and maybe even actually mean it. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Forgive them, for they don't know who I am. Forgive them, they don't know who they themselves are. Amen.